kicking off a new series, and I felt probably the best way to start our conversation today is to remind you of a game that we used to play as kids growing up. Do you remember a game called Hot or Cold? How many of you played that as a kid? Oh, yeah. Just a simple game, but exciting. You know, the object of the game, somebody would, would, would take a, an object and hide it somewhere in the room. And then your job, your responsibility was to find what was hidden. And depending on your proximity to the object that you're looking for, they would give you words to guide you. And these words were associated with temperature, either hot or cold. And the closer you were in proximity to finding the object, the warmer the words got. But the farther away you were, the, the colder the words got. So let, if we could kind of illustrate this, let's say that what I'm looking for is this podium right here, okay? We're going to take a quick little hot or cold challenge. If I'm looking for the podium, where would you say I am right now? Warmer, warmer, fire, in fuego, sizzling, boom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you, you would use temperature words. If, if you're far away, it'd be like cold, freezing, frigid, arctic. But the closer you got to what you were looking for, the words warmed up. Today, I want to take our spiritual temperature as a family. I want to see how hot we are toward the things that God is looking for. What is he passionate about? Because proximity creates passion, but distance creates distortion. Come on, are you with me? The farther away we are from the things that God cares about, maybe we are likely to have a distorted point of view. But the closer we are, it creates a burning passion within us. I pray that our church is not apathetic or indifferent to what matters to God because God is on an all-out search. The Bible says in Luke 19, verse 10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save. Listen, Jesus is looking for something. He came to seek and to save those who are lost. Can somebody say amen? You see, the prize of heaven is people. And not just any kind of people, but lost people. The church is not about buildings. It's not about denominations. It's not about a personality. It's not about bricks and sticks. The church is about people. And God loves people, so much so that he's looking for those who are lost. In fact, the, the title of the series, we're going to talk about this over the next several weeks leading up to Easter. I think this is going to be a valuable journey for us as a spiritual family. We're talking about being a friend of sinners. Friend of sinners. Um, this, you can find this phrase. How many of you have heard this phrase before? Friend of sinners. Jesus was referred to as a friend of sinners. You can read it in Luke chapter 7. The phrase was actually coined by the Pharisees and the religious leaders of that day, and they meant it as an insult. They said, Jesus comes as a glutton and a drunkard. He's eating and drinking. He's a friend of sinners. He's hanging out with the wrong kinds of people. They were trying to insult him. Has anybody ever tried to insult you? And what they meant for an insult was actually a great compliment. I remember 12 years ago, our church was walking through a season of transition. And when Rachel and I stepped in to pastor the church, I was in the community and I was talking to a guy and he meant this as an insult. He was trying to criticize me, but really he's trying to criticize you. He said, Mike, you know what the word on the street is about HPC? I said, no, tell me, what's the word on the street about healing place? He said, it's the sinner's church. The sinner's church. I thought, wow, what a compliment. I can't think of a better way to describe 
us than as a church for sinners. It's a place where those who are down and out, a place for those who are up and out, a place for those who can't figure it out. Come on, somebody. And they find a, a safe space, a soft landing in an environment where, 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 where sinners are welcomed, where saints are edified, where skeptics are disarmed. There's something to be said about a people who will love their community right where they are. I thought, man, may we always be a church for the sinner. Jesus was called a friend of sinners, and they hurled that as an insult, but Jesus wore it as a badge of honor. You know, now let me be quick to give you this disclaimer, because I know sometimes this is starting to make people nervous. Say, Pastor, better check your doctrine, check your theology. Where are we going with this? Let's be clear. Jesus never condoned sin, and he never affirmed sinful lifestyles. Okay, he always called people to repentance, all right? Jesus met people where they were, and he put his arm around them and said, come walk with me, there's a better way. Um, Jesus didn't sin to become a friend of sinners. In his holiness and in his righteousness, he stepped into dark spaces and difficult places, and he gave men and women hope. You see, the power of transformation came through the person of Jesus. And if, if our world, if our community is going to experience any kind of hope for change, somebody's got to put their arm around them and say, God loves you right where you are. But he loves you too much to leave you right where you are. Come on. Uh, listen, you don't have to embrace their sin to be their friend. You don't have to be like them but you got to like them. Come on, can I say that again? Y'all getting really quiet up in here. There's something to be said about love that steps into dark and difficult places and says, I see where you are. I love you right where you are. Come on, let's take a journey together. What does it mean to be a friend of sinners? If this was the, the ministry of Jesus 2,000 years ago, I believe that as followers of Christ, we have to investigate this aspect. If you're taking notes, and many of you know that history makers are note takers. If you're following along in the app, you will see there are three different things we'll look at this morning as we talk about being a friend of sinners. We're going to look at the mission of Jesus. We're going to look at the motivation of Jesus. And then we're going to finish by looking at the mandate of Jesus. Everybody say the mission. Say the motivation. Say the mandate. Now, let, let's look at the mission of Jesus together in Mark chapter 2. Let, let me give you some context before I read to you this narrative. Levi was a tax collector. Um, actually, his, his name is changed to Matthew. He was the writer of the first gospel of the four gospels in the New Testament. Matthew was a tax collector. It was a line of work that the Jews despised. He was despised by his brothers, by his kinsmen, by his family. He was literally disowned. He was considered a traitor, a sellout, because as a tax collector, a Jewish man working for the Roman government, his fellow brothers couldn't stomach that. On top of that, working for the oppressive government that they were under, he built his fortune on the backs of his brothers. He taxed them at a rate where he could pocket and profit off of their own suffering. And so for this, he was exiled from his community. He was cast out of Jewish life. In fact, he wasn't even allowed in the synagogue. There was no room for, the, for, for Matthew in the church at that time because of his lifestyle. Now, what's amazing is Jesus looks at Matthew in his tax collecting booth and he says, come follow me. Jesus looks at Matthew and didn't say, clean yourself up, get yourself together, change your behavior. He says, I want you on my team. Now, listen, I know that God picked me, but there are days where I don't feel like a good pick. There are days where I feel like, Lord, are you sure you, sure you know what you're doing when you wanted me to be on your team? And yet that's exactly the invitation Jesus gave to Matthew. He says, come follow me. Take a journey with me. I want you on my team. And because of that invitation, now Matthew gives Jesus an invitation. He says, Jesus, why don't you come to my house? Let's hang out 
together. See, Jesus doesn't just welcome sinners. He pursues them. Watch what happens here in Mark chapter 2, verse 15. Later, Levi, or Matthew, invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. We could call this dinner with a sinner. Come on, somebody. This is a fascinating moment in the New Testament. I'm so glad that this is recorded so we can learn from. The Bible says there were many people of this kind. Somebody say this kind. Oh, you of that kind, huh? There were many people of this kind who were among Jesus' followers. Verse 16, but when the teachers of religious law, who were Pharisees, saw Jesus eating with tax collectors and other sinners, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with such scum? Come on. And you thought you've been insulted. Look at what they're calling Jesus and this notorious group at the dinner table. Why does he hang out with such scum? Look at what Jesus said in verse 17. When Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. And I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Can somebody say amen? You see, the Pharisees were trying to shape Jesus into a version of who they thought he should be. But Jesus knew who he was, and he knew why he was here. He was a man on a mission. Jesus understood his assignment. His mission was to seek and to save those who were lost. Now, it's a dangerous thing when you think you're healthy, but you're really sick. How many of you know in our physical bodies, it can be very dangerous to think we're okay, only to find out something is seriously wrong on the inside. Jesus said, I didn't come for the healthy. Those who think they're healthy... I came for those who know that they're sick. Kind of sounds like a hospital, doesn't it? Kind of sounds like a healing place for a hurting world. Friend of sinners, I love it. Best thing you could call us, the church for sinners. You know, I, I like to go to the gym for two reasons. First of all, I mean, I, I just like being active. You know, the Bible says that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. How many of you know we need to take care of the temple? Y'all didn't say amen like you should. <laughs> My dad would say, son, look, you can have all the anointing in the world, but if you don't take care of your body, you won't live long enough to walk in the fullness of that anointing. So I like to go to the gym just for Temple, your body's a temple of the Holy Spirit. Temple maintenance, got to take care of the temple. I like to be active. But the second reason I like to go to the gym is because I get to rub shoulders with heathens. I love it. It's awesome. Um, Now look, I, I, I work in a world full of Christians. And I love Christians. I love you people. But I'm limited in a sense in this bubble of Christianity when it comes to evangelism. See, some of you think that evangelism is the pastor's responsibility. Well, Mike, it's your job to win my lost friends to the Lord. No, 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 no. God's anointed you to do that. We'll talk about that in just a second. But I love going to the gym because there's some, there's some rough guys up in the gym. And they don't have the, the church context that many of us know. And there's a group of guys in particular that I see on Mondays. And men, I just love, I love being in that proximity um, because they think very differently than I do. And when the pastor comes in, how many know the conversation changes? Oh, yeah. And there's one guy in particular that I really like. I like him. He's a short guy, bald head. And man, he, oh, yes, he needs Jesus. And all of his friends clown him and they say, oh, Pastor Mike, you don't want this guy going to your church. You know, you you don't want him to walk in the doors of your church. If he goes to your church, the walls are going to fall down. I'm telling you, the building's coming down on top of him. And he said, yeah, that's right, Pastor. There ain't no hope for me. And you know what I thought? He's probably closer to the kingdom of God 
than a lot of people who go to church every Sunday. Jesus said, I didn't come for those who think that they're healthy. I came for those who know that they're sick. And, you know, I believe that there's coming a day, an opportunity. The, the, the Lord's given me just little, little moments, favor, quick conversations, just to talk. Listen, the Bible calls us the salt of the earth. Well, the salt's got to get out of the shaker. We, we, we got to get out into the world, and we had to come in contact with some things in order to be useful. And this was the ministry, this was the mission of Jesus. Uh, now, I think we got to be careful. Again, I'm, I'm gauging our spiritual temperature here. Are we hot or cold when it comes to what God is passionate about? Uh, I'm not saying that you embrace sin, but watch this. you got to be careful. If you're more offended by the sin, then you're burdened for the sinner then there ought to be a check engine light go off in our soul. You see, when sin becomes more important to us than the sinner that says something about our priorities, Jesus was a friend of sinners. Why? Because he knew that they needed what was inside of him. And the truth is the world around you needs the spirit of God that is inside of you. You have the answer. You, you have the, the, the presence of the Lord, the power of the Holy Spirit. And when you step into dark spaces and difficult places, all of a sudden now you become the answer that they're looking for and don't even know it. Come on, are you with me? You see, the Bible says, uh, I, I love this, because uh, in Matthew 4, verse 19, Jesus said this. N notice this. The disciples didn't come to Jesus ready-made. They came to Jesus very rough and uncut, and untrained. And the Bible says in, in, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you what? Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Did Jesus know that the men he was calling to be on his team were sinful men? You better believe it. You better. And that's why he said, you need to get with me because you need what I have. And if you're going to follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Notice this. Followers of Christ are fishers of men. And if you're not fishing for men, you may not be a follower of Christ. Boy, it's getting quiet in here. How many of you know that dogs bark? Ducks quack. Cows, I did that really well, didn't I? What do sinners do? Why are we shocked when sinners sin? We're very quick to condemn their activity, but I wonder, has God burdened our heart to love them where they are and say, hey, there's a better way? You know, as followers of Jesus, we will fish for men. When was the last time you fished for a man? And I'm not just talking about to the single ladies here today, all right? <laughs> that was funny. When I said that, I thought, wait a second. Hi. <laughs> Why do we spend so many days fishing for success, fishing for popularity, fishing for fame, fishing for fortune, fishing for influence? If we're not fishing for men, we may not be followers of Jesus. Jesus says, follow me and I will make you. Somebody say, make. That means I will shape, I will form, I will build within you. The, the, the same love that Jesus has for the lost, if we are his followers, we will have that love too. My concern is we've become keepers of the aquarium instead of fishers of men. Oh, we've been in the aquarium for a long time and it's easy to get critical in the aquarium Man, it's easy to judge from the aquarium. We're trying to keep the aquarium. And Jesus said, no, you got to get out there and fish. You got to fish for people at work, in your neighborhood, in your community, at your school. Come on, are you catching this today? Somebody say the mission of Jesus. Let's look at the motivation. Number two, the motiva motivation of Christ. Why would Jesus leave heaven, the glory and splendor of heaven, to come to our broken and busted world? Well, you can trace it all the way back to the Garden of Eden. There are two significant gardens in the scripture. 
One is the Garden of Eden, and this is where paradise was lost. When sin came into the garden, God's fellowship with man was broken. And what Adam and Eve forfeited in the Garden of Eden, here comes Jesus thousands of years later in another garden of significance. It's called the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane is a word that means oil press. And Jesus, as he prayed, was crushed and just pressed, as it were. He sweat great drops of blood. And in that space, in that environment, you see what the Garden of Eden had forfeited. Jesus was now about to win in the Garden of Gethsemane as he went to Calvary. He prayed, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Why is that? Because Jesus was going to be the bridge that would, would fill the gap that our sin created. Our sin created separation from God. And so God sent Jesus to be that bridge to bring these worlds back together. Jesus knew that if the gap wasn't fixed, that the separation would be eternal. Let me say this. Hell is an uncomfortable reality. I don't think you can talk about evangelism without talking about both heaven and hell. I know there's a popular book and even movies about, you know, heaven is for real. Heaven is a real place. And granted, yes, it is. And that's the goal for every believer, man. Uh, but you know what? Hell is just as real. And we've got to talk about eternity in the context of, of, of what's happening in our world. I would do you a disservice if we didn't talk about something that's a little uncomfortable. Jesus said in Matthew 13, verse 47, again, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is like a fishing net that was thrown into the water and caught fish of every kind. When the net was full, they dragged it up onto the shore. They sat down and sorted the good fish into crates, but threw the bad ones away. That is the way it will be at the end of the world. The angels will come and will separate the wicked people from the righteous, throwing the wicked into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You say, Pastor, I'm not sure how I feel about this. Oh, pa Pastor, wait a second. I, I thought this was, you said friend of sinners. I thought this was a safe place. Maybe some people would say, yep, I knew it. I knew it. You hate people. That's why you hang in hell over everybody's head. No, no, no. Because I love God and because I love you, I owe it to you to talk to you about the hope of heaven and the reality of hell. There are people in this world that want nothing to do with God. So guess what? In the next world, they'll get exactly what they want. No fellowship or relationship with God. You know, and it is tough. It is uncomfortable. But I would hate for you to stand before God. You come to healing place and you feel all comfortable and cozy and you've never been confronted with the reality of eternal separation from God. Why didn't pastor warn me? Why didn't he tell me? Uh, listen, death is not termination. It's simply transition. Your last breath here, when you close your eyes here, you are going to open your eyes somewhere else. And there's only one of two places that that will be. Now, I know in this life, we have a lot of choices and we love making choices. Sometimes we got so many choices, we get paralyzed. We can't even decide. You ever been in a restaurant? You got a, a, a menu that was that thick and you felt like you were reading an encyclopedia and you're like, where are we going to even get started? Waiter has to circle the table three times before you make up your mind. You ever been to Izzo's and there, there was a long line behind you and you walked up in there and you're like, man, I got decisions I got to make. Am I going to get a taco? Am I going to get a burrito? Am I going to get a quesadilla? Man, what am I going to get? Oh, do I want beef? Do I want chicken? Do I want pork? And, man, how do I want this thing dressed? And man, what size do I want it? And do I want a meal deal? And man, how am I going to pay for this? Cash, credit, debit? Ah, the choice. I'm Look, y'all go ahead. Y'all get in front of me and I'll figure it out. We love to make choices, but in eternity, there will only be two. There will only be heaven with Jesus or an eternal hell without him. Listen, I don't enjoy talking about hell. I don't, but I can't avoid it either. In the Gospels, there are 60 verses 
that talk about hell. Jesus described it in great detail. In Luke 16, 23, he said, it's a place of eternal torment. In Mark 9, 43, he said, it's a place of unquenchable fire. In Mark 9, 48, he says, it's where the worm doesn't die and the flame is never quenched. In Matthew 13, 42, he said, it's a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth in anguish and regret. In Luke 16, 19, he said, it's a place of no return. There is no going back to warn your loved ones or your friends. In Matthew 25, verse 30, he says it's a place of outer darkness. In Matthew 10, 28, he compares it to Gehenna, and that was a trash heap outside of the city of Jerusalem where they would burn all of their garbage and maggots would abound. Jesus talked more about hell than he did about heaven, and here's why. Because he came to earth to tell all of us we don't have to go there. He is our hope to escape the wrath of God and the judgment that's to come. Jesus knew, he believed, and he warned about the absolute reality of an eternity apart from God. And so what is our mission? Our mission is to make it hard for people to go to hell in this city. There are almost 500,000 people in Baton Rouge. In the metropolitan area, almost 750 thousand people that walk these streets, that go to our schools, that work in our businesses, that live in our neighborhoods. And you know what? Why is Healing Place Church here? Is to remind them, look, you don't have to go to hell. Man, we're here to, sit, to, to announce to you that there is hope, and hope has a name, and his name is Jesus. If you're going to go to hell, you're going to have to ignore every outreach that we've ever done. You're going to have to close your eyes to every act of kindness on our streets. Everything that we've given away to remind people that God sees you, he loves you, and he sent Jesus to die for you. You're going to have to avoid our church services. You're going to have to harden our hearts, harden your hearts to our prayers. You're going to have to reject our message, resist our passion, renounce our spirit, and refuse our Jesus. We're going to make it hard for people to go to hell in this city. Can somebody say amen? That's why we plant campuses. That's why we do services. That's why we give in an offering. That's why we do the Dream Center. That's why we have a a team in Mexico right now building an orphanage because we want to do everything we can to let people know you don't have to die apart from Christ. See, the reality of hell will put an urgency inside of your soul. Uh, Paul said it this way in Ephesians 5 verse 15. Be careful how you live. Don't live like fools. But like those who are wise, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Number your days. Count your days. When you count your days, you make your days count. The other day, I pulled up at at an intersection. I was stopped at a red light, and I looked to my right, and I saw a guy in the car next to me. He was listening to his music, and man, he was kind of in his world. And you know what thought I had? Here's the thought that I had for him. He is made in the image of God. God created him. God loves him. I wonder if he knows that. He's an eternal soul that will live forever. I thought, who's his pastor? Does he have a church family? Who's praying for him? One day, he's going to breathe his last. God, what can I do to make a difference in his life? I was at the grocery store the other day going through the checkout line. A little girl was checking me out, and I thought the same thing. She's made in the image of God. She's an eternal soul that will live forever. I wonder, is she a part of a spiritual family where she knows that she is loved? She is valued. She is cared for. Has anybody talked to her about the gospel? Has anybody put their arm around her and says, listen, God has a plan for your life. There are people that are broken and hurting all around us. Come on, somebody. And when we understand eternity, then the mission of Jesus and the motivation of Jesus becomes clear. Let me give you this final thought. Number three, the mandate of Jesus. The mandate of Jesus. When Jesus died on the cross, his mission was complete. But he said something after he rose from the dead to his followers that became their mandate. And for us, it's our mandate as well. He says, go into all the world. 
He didn't say beg people to come to church. He said the hope that's in the church needs to go to them. And then he told them these words in, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He says, but you will receive power. Some might say power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you'll be my witnesses. Listen, what's a witness? A witness is someone who simply tells what they have seen, what they have heard, and what they've experienced. The Greek word for witness actually here is martyr. You will receive power. The Greek word is dunamis, dynamic power. You'll receive power to be a witness of me, telling people about me everywhere, starting in Jerusalem. Where's Jerusalem? That's your household. Where do you start to be a friend of those who are lost and hurting and broken? You start in your own family. You start with those closest to you. In Jerusalem and then Judea. What's Judea? Your neighborhood. How many got some craziness up in your hood? How many of you live next door to crazy? Lost. I'm telling you. just Man, you, you start with your family, but then you got to be a witness in, in your neighborhood. Judea is your neighborhood. Then he says, go to Samaria. What's Samaria? Your enemies. The Jews and Samaritans did not get along. And Jesus now is telling them, I've given you the Holy Spirit to be a witness. And yes, I'm going to use you to influence those who don't like you. And maybe you don't even like, come on, are you with me? And then he said to the outermost parts of the world, some of us have prayed, Lord, send revival. God, send revival. We said, Lord, send revival to our city. And you know what God says? I have. You're it. I sent you. God, send revival to my school. He says, I did. As a student in that school, I'm sending you. Lord, send revival to my neighborhood. Send revival to my workplace. Oh, Lord, if you just pour out your spirit. He said, I did. I put my spirit inside of you. And now you go in that power and you tell people about me. You can be a friend. You can love somebody where they are into where God wants them to be. College, I played basketball with a, a guy from Trinidad, Tobago. He was six foot seven, six foot eight, about 230 pounds. I mean, he was a specimen. I didn't, I didn't know what the human body was supposed to look like until I met Dwayne Elliott. I was like, oh. Okay, so that's what it, the perfect body looks like. And he could dunk the ball any way you wanted him to. Transferred from Birmingham Southern, came to, came to our school. And we, we developed a friendship relationship, man. He, he was a tremendous athlete. And the Lord put it on my heart, man, you just need to love this guy. Be a friend to him. Just be a friend to him. Christmas break, we got a couple days off. He came home with me. We struggled to feed him. <laughs> but I just, I loved Dwayne. I loved him. Didn't ask him about his faith. It didn't, you know, at that point, I mean, it wasn't really a criteria to be a friend. I just, God put him on a team and I felt like I was supposed to love him, care about him. He came to me toward the end of the season and said, Mike, I just want you to know, I've, uh, I've been on a search trying to find purpose and meaning and I've, I've decided that Islam is the way, that I, I need to be a Muslim. I didn't panic. I didn't react. I didn't try to rescue him. I said, well, Dwayne, that, that's interesting. How did you reach that conclusion? And he told me the things that he studied and read. And so I asked him, I said, well, Dwayne, have you ever read the Bible? You ever read the Gospels? He said, no. I said, well, look, before you make this decision on what steps to take with your faith, how about we read the Bible together? And you know what? We did. We, sent, we spent that entire spring semester reading the Bible. And it wasn't me trying to preach to him. It was me coming alongside him and studying the gospels with him. And do you know, by the end of that spring semester in my apartment, I had the privilege of being able to pray with Dwayne to receive Jesus Christ as his savior and his Lord. The word does the work. Can somebody say amen? It starts with being a friend. Aren't you glad that in your sin and in your sorrow and in your suffering that Jesus stepped in and he put his arm around you? and said, walk with me.